Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 8 on Resource Management. This is our first video. We're going to be looking a little bit at agricultural resources. This is the first in three sections that we're going to be looking at in this last module that we have for Earth and Environmental Science. And this first inquiry question comes from, I guess, the overarching header of using Australia's natural resources. So our first inquiry question is how are Australia's natural resources extracted, used and managed? It's always useful with these inquiry questions to produce a little bit of a brainstorm session, a little bit of an overview of what you, how you already are thinking about this, and that way you can contextualise the information that's going to come in this series of videos and as well as what we're going to be doing in class in order to help you um, wrestle with this question of how Australia's natural resources are extracted, used and managed. So for this particular video we're trying to identify Australian renewable resources, where they're located and including but not limited to agricultural resources both terrestrial and aquatic. So I guess the first thing we need to do is just define renewable resources and renewable resources are those resources that we obtained naturally that are constantly replenished. That is um, the sun, light from the sun, wind, waves, biomass, water, uh, and also geothermal when we're talking about energy generation. So we think about resources both in terms of their ability to produce energy, that is something that having come out of our climate science module, we do want to continue to think about ways in which we are trying to improve this situation. So we can see in terms of renewable energy sources, solar's right up there, wind, biomass, bioenergy, we're going to be looking at those in a little bit more detail. We also have a little bit of, uh, had a bit of a dabble into the hydroelectric kind of way of generating energy as well. These are very important resources, but they're not just for energy generation. Some of them have other purposes or other value beyond merely their ability to generate energy. So we'll be having a look at those in a little bit of detail in this particular topic. So we've looked at some of these kinds of maps before, land use maps within New South Wales, and you can see the types of uh, ways that these sorts of areas of land have been classified or categorised and we've done this before. We've got a sort of level of sustainability that we have um, some areas at, at slight to moderate risk of degradation and obviously some areas that are, have been very significantly affected and therefore would be almost impossible to return back to their original point. Now of course our focus at the moment is on agriculture. And if our focus is on agriculture, then we need to make sure that we're thinking about what actually happens to the land as a result of these agricultural practices. Now, agriculture is going to lead most obviously to biomass, and biomass is a renewable resource. And of course, primarily a lot of what biomass um, is used for is as a food source. And it's not just a food source for humans, it can also be a food source for livestock that are going to ultimately be a food source for humans. But there's a couple of aspects to agriculture that we need to be aware of. Food and agriculture are fundamental to human survival and it was the birth of agriculture and farming that laid down the basis for human civilization. We go back and we have a look at the ways in which uh, human societies have changed. One of the things that did change the, the hunter-gatherer into more of an agricultural lifestyle was when they understood how um, this process of particularly plant seasonality works, um, of plant life cycles, of how we might be able to move plants from one area rather than chasing them around to actually where we are, and so therefore to be able to care for them uh, more directly. Of course, this had a huge amount of implications because it didn't just change human society, it also changed the plants and ultimately the animals as well as a result of this idea of domestication. Now, we're probably familiar with domestication um, applying to things like animals. So we've talked about domesticating animals as well that have become either uh, beasts of burden or have become food sources for us. 
But that's also what's happened to some of the crops that we've used in our agricultural practices. They too have become domesticated and have changed. And we can see some of the ways, particularly things like uh, wheat, members of the brassica family, everything from cabbages and cauliflower to uh, Brussels sprouts or broccoli. These have changed and they've basically changed because we've worked out ways of domesticating or of affecting their growth patterns so that they produce the, the ideal growth for our uh, human purposes. Of course, technology and innovation have continued to advance agriculture and also domestication. And now we've got this massive amount of the planet that's being dedicated to the growth of uh, crops for humans or for livestock. Since the Green Revolution in the early 1960s, crop production has increased dramatically and achieved um, only about 15% more cropped land. Agriculture today is very sophisticated and highly technical industry and in Australia it's been one of our most innovative and effective industries. Australian farmers have remained competitive in a global food market despite Australia having low levels of subsidies relative to many of our major competitors. The ability of this industry to adapt, innovate and form successful collaborations will continue to support a strong and prosperous Australia with sustainable food security. And this also affects our status as an exporter. So our health as a nation and our well-being, our economic prosperity, a lot of these things are linked to um, how effectively, how good we are at producing agricultural crops and livestock and how good we are exporting those as well. So that means we need to make sure that we are sustainable, we can feed our own population, but we've also got that excess that we can export to other nations as well to feed um, a much larger population than the one that is actually occupying our land. So if we delve a little deeper into agriculture, we know that although we only account for about 3% of the global food trade, our food exports are worth more than 30 billion annually. And we're one of only 11 countries that are net food exporters. That is, we produce more than we actually consume. Agricultural production has remained important in our economy because we've effectively developed and delivered new technologies through a strong research base and highly skilled and innovative farming community. And we'll have a look at one in particular um, way of farming that is very, very different and has uh, been established for some time and is perhaps leading a bit of a charge into a change in the way that um, farming is actually done. We've been able to maintain our position on the world stage in terms of agriculture, despite the fact that we inhabit an incredibly dry continent. The quality of the soils is very poor and our climate variability um, is very high. And you can see we've experienced this year in particular some significant um, extremes in some of those uh, climate conditions. Now, agriculture is not the only thing that we do in Australia. We also do aquaculture as well. And as a result of that, we're able to um, farm a number of species that live in aquatic or marine environments in a very effective way, just as we do the terrestrial ones on land. One of the things that I think is interesting to look at is some of the ways that are revolutionizing the process of agriculture. There's two interesting books that are actually worth having a bit of a read, and I, I know it's hard to suggest reading uh, when you're in the middle of HSCs, but these two books are absolutely fabulous in terms of how we go about making a change. The first of these is actually uh, based on a strategy that occurred in the south of England. The book's called Wilding, and Isabella Tree is um, part of a husband and wife partnership that have completely changed NEP, the area uh, which used to be very heavily farmed. It had been in the family for some hundreds of years, but in around about 2000, they had to sell the dairy aspect of that farm because it simply wasn't making enough money. The decision was made to actually go back to the wild, to do a process which we now refer to as rewilding, which is basically bringing back a lot of those native animals that had been cleared away either deliberately or because of uh, changes in land use that meant that habitats were being destroyed or that the um, native food, the vegetation that was being um, 
consumed by a large number of native species was now no longer available. About 20 years on, and this process has been an incredible success. In fact, you can, you can book in and go and visit and stay on this particular property uh, in a range of different um, sort of camping to glamping kind of ways in order to get an idea of exactly what's happened. When you look at the list of native species, particularly bird species that have recolonized this area since this process of returning the lands back to their natural form. Uh, it's just incredible and a really great success story. A little closer to home, we have Peter Andrews who featured on Australian Story in about 2006, I think. Um, and his story is about back from the brink. He was doing a lot of stuff to try and um, get more productivity out of his land, out of his farm, but he did it in a completely different way. He looked at something which um, is referred to as natural sequence farming. Um, and he's had incredible success with this. And he's had to deal with a huge amount of negativity and criticism for the approach that he had. Now, of course, his ideas and his expertise is being sought out by people all around the country who are realizing that the nature of Australian soils is such that it just doesn't sustain this kind of long-term uh, impact of um, heavy farming. And so as a result of that, something different may actually be the solution. And, and this too is a great story to have a look at. The final thing that we probably want a bit of a, a chat about is aquaculture. So we do want to talk about some of the um, farming practices that have actually been applied in aquatic uh, organisations. And Australia's Commonwealth State and Territory Governments manage fisheries in consultation with the fishing industry and as well as scientists, economists and other user groups that um, have a stake in traditional fishing, recreational fishing and also environmental management. All of these processes are used to ensure that there are controls and regulations on how fishing um, can occur in a sustainable manner. And this is one of the things that's been very interesting. We've created a lot of dams. We've um, looked at ways of being able to fish, uh, even in the oceans, in uh, very heavy ways and often in indis indiscriminate ways. That is, we catch everything, large, small, uh, edible, non-edible, usable, non-usable. And the result of that is that we've really desperately overfished our oceans. And one of the things that we'll be looking at later in this particular module uh, is over-harvesting. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But aquaculture isn't just about fish. We've got mollusks, crustaceans, a large number of aquatic plants are also um, are farmed in this kind of a way. And so you can see there's a huge uh, impact that agriculture and aquaculture have on our uh, economy, on our lifestyle, on our food preferences. And this is really the focus or at least the beginning of this story, this last story on resource management. Because we're so successful at farming, we've been so successful in agriculture and aquaculture, we've changed so much of the land, it's changing um, not just the nature of Australia, but also native organisms and the, the actual ecosystems that exist within this country. So we need to have a little bit of a look at that to see if we're managing our resources in an effective way. But that's something that we'll continue to look at throughout this um, first section of Module 8. Thanks for watching.